when I started this um, years ago at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, where I was a subject matter expert having been a power trader um, during the California energy crisis, that um, I actually would find bad guys. And industry doesn't like when you find bad guys. Um, so I'm going to tell you some, some of my history really quickly to try to establish some level of trust. Um, let's see if this works. Yeah, so I'm going to do this as fast. I have like 12 slides about who I am, and I'm going to try to do it in 30 seconds. I have done everything in commodities. I am one of the, the remaining or less living apprentices. I started in a vault for, for coins in New York and did every job. So I walked uh, um, gold, silver, numismatics around the streets of New York. I became a, the assistant vault manager. It was a big promotion. Um, I became a coin trader. I traded coins for years for uh, Makata medals and federal coin and currency. I did um, COMEX arbitrage, which is, I was the floor clerk on the old COMEX when they wrote on the boards, rather than having electronic uh, uh, trade boards. Um, I did the reconciliation of COMEX trades on the floor. I traded foreign exchange. I did uh, um, IMM piggyback arbitrage against the, the, the dealer market. I was an arbitrager of gold products of exchange versus exchange, so I did Winnipeg versus Chicago, Chicago against New York, and any other place that I could find a, an arbitrage. I became a Mercado Metals a manager of gold bullion and foreign exchange and the chief gold trader. I was 28 years old, I had 28 people working for me. That was fun, I, I have to say that was a, 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 a tremendous um, ego boost. To be, to be a personage in the gold market. Um, I went to, down to the floor to run the, the options uh, book. I became senior precious metals uh, trader at Credit Suisse. I traded at Gerald Metals for several years. Twice, um, I was the director of dealing for Engelhard. Um, uh, then back to Gerald, and then Lehman Brothers. This is Lehman before the Lehman coll collapse. Lehman was in commodities for years, and then it exited. And then I changed my career, and I became a power trader. Uh, power trading is much more difficult than trading. It's the hardest commodity in the world to trade ele electricity. Um, and I became a California power trader. I worked for Constellation, and Constellation at the time was a joint venture between Goldman Sachs and Baltimore Gas and Electric. And then I went to the government, and I was the subject matter expert for the Federal, uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and ultimately I became the authority of how to find manipulation in energy markets. Um, from there, I joined the, the CFTC, um, was hired essentially by Gary Gensler, um, to change the orientation of the surveillance group. Surveillance at CFTC prior to my arriving was focused on trade practice abuses, which is, did you fill out your cards on the floor correctly? Um, uh, and explaining market events um, and I changed that to, we're a data-centric organization. We have the best data. We should be able to tell the world what happened from the data and not from a Reuters report. Okay, I have a couple ground rules. I can't, I'm not legally allowed to talk about what it was that I did at the commission. And that means that um, I can't, I also can't speak for the commission. No one is legally allowed ever to speak for the commission other than the commission. And this is true for every uh, 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 executive branch agency. Only the, the um, uh, we call them the great Americans, those who are selected by the president and are confirmed by the Senate are allowed to speak for the commission. So I won't speak for, for, the, for the commission. 
I can't speak about the confidential data. So if you say, I really want to know what JP Morgan's positions are, I can't talk about that, all right? The, the advantage of being the head of surveillance at the CFTC is you can see everything. And I'll talk a lot about what you can see. Um, the problem with casework, casework takes forever. When I left the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, as a way of illustration, that was in 2011, um, there were cases that were closing in 2019 and 20 that I had finished while I was there. Um, my staff's work at the CFTC can, can still be working, they can still be working today on matters that I informed before I retired. I'm out of the government for not quite two years. Um, to get on the same page, I believe this. Every market can be manipulated. Every single one. My experience is, is that if you start turning over rocks, you're going to find slugs. The question is, is the slug acting in a legal or an illegal manner? Right? But there are bad actors. There are bad actors everywhere. And, and this, is, this is my primary driver. I said, if we look, we're going to find. Um, <laughs> someone is likely trying to manipulate, and attempted manipulation in my world is, it is manipulation, um, to alter a market or a product for profit, for gain, at some time. So you think about the, the size of the markets, and we'll talk about markets in a moment, the size of the markets. Um, 90,000, 100,000 futures contracts that are listed, add the options on top of that, add all the open swaps on top of that, and say, how big is the world? Everything is trading down to the millisecond level. Someone, someplace, is going to try to trade for effect to enhance the value of something in their portfolio. Is it happening 24 hours, seven in all markets? No. Does it happen regularly in, in markets? Absolutely. Um, not every market is manipulated every day. Not every, a, a, every piece of information in the market contributes to a manipulation. But, but it's out there often enough. Um, with data, when you have a complete data set, and we can talk about what complete means, when you have a complete data set, you can uncover everything. There is a, um, a difficulty, and that is, can we convince a, an attorney that they can convince a finder of fact, a judge or a jury, that what we observe in the data is a strong enough claim to get a conviction. And that is a much harder bar. But I can see in the data quite regularly the incentive to manipulate and the actions in the market that are the manipulation. So now we have to talk about what's the market. <laughs> Obviously, CFTC says the markets are futures and options on futures. And it gets a little more complicated. You got swaps and swaptions. And it gets a little more complicated again. And this is what you care about. The physical trades, and I would say contracts, agreements, and transfers. To understand a portfolio of anybody, you have to understand all the pieces. You can't just say, I'm looking at futures. If you only look at futures, you cannot find manipulation. If you only look at futures, you might be able to find spoofing. But you cannot find manipulation. You think of it, uh, think of the portfolio as a three-legged stool. It's got physical, whatever physical means, it could be ET, uh, ETFs, right, other securities, um, physical transactions, agreements for transfer, transportation agreements, shipping agreements, whatever they've got, um, refining uh, agreements, um, swaps and swaptions, and then the futures market. It's incredibly complex, and in some, for some firms, if you say, if someone says, 
oh, um, you know, I have 50 million lines of transactions to give you for a two-year period of trades. And you go, okay, yeah, that, that's about right. <laughs> the, the, the major market participants have fabulous amounts of volume that gets tra transacted. So putting it all back into a coherent um, uh, package so that the analyst can understand the portfolio of the actor as well as the actor understood his own portfolio on the day that it was transacted, um, that the transactions took place, that's a task, and that can take years. The, there, and I'll explain why. Um, I'm gonna skip this part really quick, the difference between investigations and, and surveillance, and only say one thing. There is a difference. Investigations are official, um, uh, they can be informal, but they're official um, actions of the Division of Enforcement at CFTC, and generally speaking, it means they have subpoena authority. Um, surveillance doesn't have subpoena authority. Su surveillance actually has something that's as good, um, and that is called special call. Any transaction by a market participant or registrant can be called upon to produce all books and records, every transaction, every related, uh, or related um, financial agreement by um, a letter. So, the, the surveillance group can have a full portfolio look uh, at, at any actor. The process, and so I think this applies to the, to the public, as, uh, particularly the first two, the, the first two um, bullets. Um, I had to explain and teach that because there's so much emotion that the analysts invest, in uh, finding out whether a participant is a bad actor or not, that they bring their opinions to the, to the process. And your opinion is not a fact. You have to find it in the data. You have to find some, some place that, that says something is truthful as opposed to, I want it to be this, and so I'll represent it through numbers or statistics. So don't care about, about your opinion. Belief is not evidence itself. And you'll hear people say, my gut's told me. And I said, I'm, I'm a big gut guy. I, I traded off my gut. He said, what you're really saying is at the moment, I can't articulate all the factors that I've taken in to come to a conclusion for that, re that makes me act. But you can't go to court with that. If you go to court with that, you lose. You can't say, I believe they did it, and therefore you should convict them. When we um, ask questions, or someone asks questions of us, you have to be very careful that they're not making declarations that's testimony. They make a, it's, it, it's a version of, when did you stop beating your wife? Um, it's very easy to bring your assumption or your belief through uh, a question that is testifying rather than asking for uh, an answer that's verifiable. Um, the most important question is number four for how we operate and how all surveillance operates. So I taught this at two different institutions and I have had this discussion with many other um, surveillance groups nationally, internationally, and at the state level. Can you see what the observer saw? So if you think about how a investigation can start, it can start with a tip, a complaint, something that's in the press. But surveillance can only look at the data that it has. It doesn't start from some external source. It starts from the data. So if someone says, Charlie was beating his wife, you know, Charlie was abusing the market. You go, where can I see that in the data? So there's a difference between confidential and public data. Public data only gives you um, a very sh small amount of information. It tells you when a trade took place, what the volume of that trade was, and what the price was. That will not tell you whether a bad actor was trading. 
It will just tell you a trade took place. So if an observer is using public data and then is saying it means this, say, how could you know that? You're, if you're projecting assumptions into the data, then your conclusion, and I'm going to jump ahead and just use a phrase that came out of an earlier silver market uh, um, investigation called failure, where the judge said, I think it was Judge Patterson said, that um, the, the plaintiffs were making conclusionary allegations. You say something to, because you hope it to be true, believe it to be true, but has no evidence behind it whatsoever. We have to, at, at surveillance, you have to operate within what law? What is it that you're looking at and why? Um, right? And is the behavior that you're witnessing legal and according to the law or not? Should is not part of the equation. So if the basic assumption, I'm going to jump way ahead. Um, if the basic assumption is that the United States uh, dollar should be backed, use the word should, should be backed by physical asset, but legally it's not. It has no part in my understanding of how I look at the, the, the behaviors in derivatives, because the should doesn't apply. Go to Congress, change the law, that's an entirely different matter. But should is not something that gets applied in the process of can we find a bad actor. That's not to say that you don't sometimes get asked about policy. We won't talk about that. Um, so, major violation, of course, for me, they, is manipulation. I care about manipulation more than anything else. Most manipulation is benchmark manipulation. Uh, minor violations are all the per se violations. You didn't fill out the form, you had a position limit violation, all the small stuff that, that's in the rules and regulations. Okay, uh, so most minor violations right, tie somehow to record keeping. Major violation is always about price uh, benchmarks. All the ones that you follow in the press that are big are like the, um, uh, the Barclays case where they manipulated the gold fix to get at the value of a derivative. All right. Okay, so um, this is the truth of the world of surveillance. Every trade and every position creates an audit trail. The fingerprints are there. You need to know who's acting, who controls the activity, and what are the related positions. Um, if you get lucky, a speaking document will exist that the lawyers will like that says, I am guilty. They, lawyers do not like data-driven um, uh, cases because Lawyers, for the most part, cannot look at the trade record and understand that, that this is a language like Turkish that is saying that I killed my wife with a knife in the library, um, where if they have a note written in Turkish that said that phrase, since they don't read Turkish, they would say they don't have a confession. That's the problem. Um, all right. Okay, so... This is what the market is made of, right? The data for futures and options that the CFTC can see is fabulous. It's at account level, right? So I can see, and people were always surprised. They say, can you see me in the cattle market? Oh yeah, you're right, 902 and so many microseconds. I see you placed an order. I see when it was filled. Um, uh, so that data is fabulous. It's highly detailed, and there are two levels of it. One is transaction and position, and then the, uh, the other is messages. Just what was sent in and didn't get filled, right, was unactionable. Swaps and swaptions. Um, let's see, swaps, swaps, and sw swaps and swaptions. Um, another level, the, the data is very good. You can see the actor, you can see formation, and we can get um, uh, information behind the transaction from the participant. Uh, 
let's see. One more. And the last one is physical. The problem with data is the physical data doesn't exist for, the, for anybody. It's not collected. So if you say, um, what happened in the silver market yesterday, in the cash market, in what, spot London, right, as it traded throughout the day? That's not collected, all right, and doesn't exist. As a, uh, uh, um, no other agency collects it. Treasury doesn't collect it. Um, foreign exchange. Who's collecting the cash data? Nobody. It's not regulated. And what does that mean? That cash markets, um, trading platforms, even big ones, are not regulated by anybody. And if the, you've been following the crypto world lately, there is a bill that was proposed by the Senate to um, um, create regulations uh, under the authority of the CFTC for uh, crypto commodities. And that would be the first time that the, the CFTC would have cash market um, authority. And we'll get a little bit, I would say it gets a little dicier, it gets a little more interesting. So there's no data that's collected. So if you say to me, can you see what happened in the agricultural space? The answer is no. Can I see what I saw? Uh, can you see what's happening in the treasury space? No. Can you see what, what's happening in gold, silver, platinum, palladium? The answer is no. Can we get data um, from different sources and put something back together? Yes. But it's not collected in, uh, or regulated in a um, um, official way where the derivatives markets are. So I'm, as an example, sometimes information will be shared. Information is easily shared if there's a memorandum of understanding or a subpoena. Surveillance does not generally have any access to subpoena. So information is to do ordinary work, just to look at what were you doing at two o'clock yesterday with the trade that you posted of 3,000 contracts. I have to make a request under an authority to get that information. It's not collected ordinarily. The resources of the surveillance group, and I will argue of the commission, are incredibly tight. When I joined in 11, um, I had 69 staffers. When I left, I had 12 analysts. You cannot look at near 100,000 different instruments and millions of open swaps with 12 people and say you're gonna find everything. We will find things. Are we looking at the right thing at the right time? Probably not. Forensically, can we find it later? Sometimes, yes. All right, if the data exists, we can see it, we can find it. Okay, so the problem with curiosity, if I want to know something, I have all this data, should I use it? And the answer is no. We only look for crime. You're looking for an illegal act. If somebody says, well, how did the market work? That, those are other people that do that. That should be the uh, Office of the Chief Economist. That could be the Market Intelligence Branch. But it is not a surveillance exercise to say, hmm, that was interesting. What does it mean? It has to be related to crime. All right. OK, spoofing is the topic of the day. Um, spoofing, it becomes illegal in 2010. It doesn't drop everything because there's a new regulation. It took years to create space to be able to build detection programs, which took years to be able to look at the data that's available. And message data, at least while I was there, was not delivered daily. You'd have to ask for it as a special project from the uh, exchanges. Message data, uh, right, is the, the, the data where you can detect spoofing. Transaction data will only tell you what traded. It won't tell you how the market formed. 
So spoofing, simple spoofing that's caught by um, and prosecuted for the most part is layering. Somebody puts in an order to sell two and then puts in a layered set of bids by one, five, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and you go, look, there's all this demand below the market to get the two lots to trade. It isn't to get 500 lots to trade or to get 1,000 lots to trade. It's very small volumes. And the whole point of spoofing is to make things vibrate all day long, up and down, as often as you can to collect small amounts of money repetitively. It isn't to do it once. If somebody spoofs once for 20 cents on two contracts, $40 in gold, and never does it again, it will never be detected. It's a repetitive behavior. This is the most uh, difficult thing to do to detect benchmark manipulation, but it is the most interesting and the most, uh, in my mind, the most valid because this is where the, the greatest abuses take place. So the most famous benchmark manipulation case is LIBOR. Um, that was a survey. I say, and when I say that every market can be manipulated, is you only need two things to manipulate a market, capital and will. And with a survey, you only need will. You don't need any money to do it. Um, so benchmark manipulation is difficult because we don't have that third group. We don't have the trading in the, in the instrument that sets the index. So if you think about the S&P 500, we don't get S&P 500 um, uh, security transactions. The gold fix, I can see the fix, but I can't see the transactions that went into the fix. If somebody says that, that a benchmark was manipulated, oil market, all right, uh, that, that it's being manipulated, we don't get that data. The other thing is collusion. How does collusion operate? It's very hard to detect. It's detectable, but it's very hard. And for a swap, a single out of millions, a single transaction can be an incentive to manipulate any period of time. All right, all right, because benchmarks are set by contract terms. So you could say, what is the 12 o'clock price in any commodity? All right, all right, set an index, uh, uh, pardon me, set um, a swap to that. And how am I to know that there's today a 12 o'clock price that I should care about that's going to get pushed around because someone has a derivative that is settling to it? Very difficult. Um, the other thing about the target of a benchmark manipulation is it could be an actual physical trade. All right, we don't collect the physical data. I can't know that the physical was the target as opposed to a derivative. What else does surveillance do? Well, we're subject matter called to explain all sorts of things. So if somebody says, what's happening in the RIN market? You're going to call somebody either in the market intelligence branch or in surveillance to come and explain it. I can't tell you the number of times that I've had to go to some place like uh, uh, Congress or uh, executive grounds to explain some market behavior um, based on our data or our understanding of how a foreign market operates. So we're responsive to the executive branch, the congressional letters, and to other departments. I know there have been lots of letters written um, by interested physical market participants who say CFTC is unresponsive to the congressman. You know, so I'll point out Congressman Mooney, Mooney's uh, letters. All I can tell you is I spend a lot of time in giving very detailed answers um, to very specific questions that have been asked, and it's not my job to give it to Congress. It is the chairman and the Office of Public Affairs job to do that. My information may have well too much confidential information about how the world works that can't be released. Been to the Hill many times to explain how things work and what we see. Um, I've talked to other departments, Treasury. I spent a lot of time speaking to Treasury about um, activities in the Treasury market and in Treasury futures. Um, we serve the chairman. We answer other division requests for expertise. Um, a lot of meetings. And this last thing, you're supposed to be 
uh, market monitoring. Market monitoring to me is uh, a fairly useless activity. It means watching a screen, right? Oh, look at that, price has moved up. Everybody can do that. You don't know anything about what's happening underneath and who may or may be acting with uh, illegal intent. Most surveillance exercises are forensic. It can't happen in real time. We don't even get the data earliest for one day. Okay, and so I, I'm going to highlight God every moment. Um, I spoke with, with people from God often, uh, often. I don't believe that, uh, that my expertise um, is, uh, is, is so superior that I can't learn from somebody else. Somebody has an observation, I want to hear it. If it's something that's empirical, I can look at it. But I am the most unsatisfactory communicant in the world. In the government, it's one way. You tell me what you see, and I never respond. I'm not allowed to tell you what I found. So in this one, he said, I said uh, that EFPs uh, were not deliverable. Well, it misunderstands what an EFP was and what I said. So um, EFPs can only be used, um, and they should be thought of as it's a two-legged instrument. It's a physical instrument or some other related position. It could be a swap. I'm, I'm going to argue it could be uh, uh, an ETF. It's something else for futures equivalent. Um, that futures contract now is treated as any other futures contract. It's not special at all. So if you had, had a position, I was long futures, and I sell the future side of an EFP, sell futures, buy cash, then the futures will cancel. That's not settling. Settling is when you go to delivery and you deliver the warrant, all right, and you receive cash. So EFPs can be traded to the end of the delivery month, which means there's one day out of the entire life, it could be seven years, it could be 12 years, entire life of the futures contract, where that EFP can only, uh, the, the EFP leg of futures can be applied against remaining open interest. So um, it misunderstands how EFPs work, and EFPs are ordinary instruments. They're traded every single day. They're not emergency uh, instruments. So um, I'm going to say the author of the letter was calling me out, and and I would and have spoken with with him many times. He said, "I like the opportunity today to say, no, you're wrong, and this is how it works." Um, okay, so the COMEX rule book doesn't say anything about um, cash settlement substitution. If someone wants to say to me that in an emergency the exchange can do anything, I'm going to pretty much agree with that. They have lots of flexibility if the exchange is under threat itself. But under ordinary circumstances, delivery is going to take place. Delivery, there has not been a true disruption or a failure of delivery ever, ever. So the idea that it's imminent every single delivery month, that it's imminent collapse, that there's failure there, misunderstands how futures work, what the purpose of futures, I don't know if I covered this before, but um, for instance, what is, why do people use futures? The reason is, for the most part, it's a risk transfer price exposure only. It's not going to delivery. They, futures rarely go to delivery. And that's well understood. It's not to say that that physical commodity can't. They can, sometimes. And people can stand for delivery. But standing for delivery takes place only in the delivery month. It doesn't take place as open interest to say, oh, next December, um, the open interest make it up, 100,000 contracts, they're standing for delivery. No, it's just open interest. When you get into December, we can talk about who might be standing and how much. And it tends to be small numbers, smaller numbers. Okay, um, I covered that before. 
And this gives me a really good um, example of, uh, to show the difference between the two. The Vanity Fair article was um, an inflammatory article saying essentially that there's information that's being released early someplace and um, they have this information. They're not manipulating, but they are abusing the market and they make these comments about volume, which is just pure volume, not change in open interest. It's not positional, but they are assuming that the volume went to position and was held for periods of time and then was exited uh, all right, on reopening. He said, none of that occurred. The public data is insufficient to make a conclusion. All right, the, you can't, looking at it, at public data, will not inform you about the behaviors of actors at all. It doesn't tell you that. Um, so the, the article says, and I think it's in there, it says that, um, if it's this one, or, um, yeah, I want to just say it. That the, that the CFTC says that they can see this information. It says that in the article, and I, I don't know if I pulled the, the quote out. Truth is, yeah, we can see. We can see exactly who traded, right? What positions they had, what positions they had elsewhere. So if somebody knew that Tehran was going to make an announcement and was leaking that information for, for, um, uh, pro for profit, um, we can look at that actors who took positions, if they took positions, did we see what the observers said we saw? Um, no, 120,000 contracts didn't go into strong hands of a few individuals or an individual. All right, can you see that, uh, see that in the data? Yes. Um, and did they trade anything else? If you're saying it's Tehran um, and Iran is, is doing this, then we would look at the oil market necessarily too. We'd look at oil derivative markets. We look at the options markets of it. We'd look at the swaps market. We go a lot further than just saying, oh, the allegation is something happened in a market. We take it to, to follow the, uh, whatever breadcrumb trails are available. If you have a name, you can follow the activity of, the, of that individual or that, that entity. Uh, let's see. Yes, this is when they, they said, you should be able to see it. But calls to the CME, no response. Calls to, to the, the, the CFTC, federal government, no response. Because we're not allowed to tell you about the discrete actions of actors. All right. Um, so this is exchange data we can tell you exactly what happened within two hours and built lots of tools to create summary reports about information. Um, my favorite is, is the price contribution attribution exercise that can be done. As you know, in futures, uh, prices can only change if you cross the bid offer spread. So you can measure that. Um, you can see if somebody attacks the market in any period of time, a fraction of a second, a minute, five minutes, a day, a week, a year, five years. So you can get really good view of an actor, class of actors, uh, um, or any, a, a, any shape of, of the data that, that you want to see how people behave. And all it tells you is, it's not saying you're manipulating, it says when this actor comes to the market. This is how they behave. They're aggressive and they hit bids, they lift offers and move markets. All right. CFTC's jurisdiction is der derivatives. That's important because in your retail world, this is the actual uh, authority that allows the CFTC to cross into the retail physical gold and silver world. And you'll notice that it is about that they are either futures or derivatives, right? According to this, delivery didn't take place. 
and uh, if there was leverage, you weren't a re that, that the entity was not registered. It's not saying anything about the, the underlying cash market itself and, it's, and it being jurisdictional. It is, you need to be a registrant to trade these products and as a registrant be responsive to the rules and regulations uh, that, of that registrant. So, strictly speaking, cash markets are not jurisdictional from the perspective of, uh, uh, of rules or registration requirements. Can we miss things? Of course. <laughs> With budgets that are devastated and limited resources, you can miss things all the time. I've never said, I've told you right at the front, I believe everything, every market can be manipulated, and they often are. Finding it is hard, all right? Um, it's not to say you can't get a good view, and it doesn't mean we don't catch people. We do. We do. And that's it. I know I covered a lot of territory, and I know some of it's boring. <laughs> um, but if anybody has questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Just remember, I cannot tell you about the specific activity of anybody. So we can talk in generalities, but I can't say, oh, is it true that uh, making it up, Credit Suisse has this giant, uh, you know, short in such and such? I can't talk about that. Yes. So you're asking a specific question about spoofing. I can't talk about spoofing because I can't, I can't um, say they, they did, my CFTC did, because remember I'm there then, right? That we did or we did not refer conduct. So the, the idea, CFTC had its own case, all right, of spoofing against J.P. Morgan. DOJ's interest is different than, uh, uh, than CFTC's. And the process of, of, so you say, think of it this way. Anything happened before 2010 in spoofing. I know spoofing took place in my career all the time, right? And, and how do I know that? Well... As a professional dealer, gold and silver, the board would light up, right? As every dealer came running for some reason at the same time to as, as one of 28 dealers, and my board is lit, and I would say, don't answer the phones. I want to watch what's happening on the floor. And one of the actors will have essentially said, uh, said to his broker, bid it up, don't buy anything. So when the market goes up, that one of those actors is going to slam me, right, with something that's mispriced, right? Greater volume for uh, an artificial move in the market. And the only protection is to wait a few seconds. I'm not under any obligation to quote any major dealer. He can wait, right? I am not here to provide liquidity and take losses, so I would wait. And I know that that was... Um, something that was frowned upon by the community, right? They said, what do you mean you wait? He said, you should be responsive to the biggest banks. They go, no, not when they are doing something that I think is just a trick. It wasn't illegal, right? Unethical, maybe, All right, but not illegal. So in my career, it existed. Um, the, the, when electronic trading, and if you think about electronic trading, comes to the fore, and I'm trying to remember the exact year that, it might be 2006 when you had the first side-by-side -side trading in natural gas, um, and then shortly thereafter, the floor disappeared. So everything became electronic. Uh, 2006, September 2006, if memory serves right, that's the beginning of it. Um, so spoofing as a distinct charge doesn't exist. I would argue that under the anti-manipulation rules, it was still there, but the data wasn't collected. So this data is message data. Message data is not required to be delivered to the CFTC on a daily basis. So you have to be looking for something to ask for the message data to build a screen that will sh to show you, and I call it simple, uh, simple layering, the most basic type of spoofing. You have to build that screen. 
The good news is the screens were built and you have essentially five years to look back. But you don't get to look back forever. Right? So that's part of, I would say, my excuse at being at the CFTC, trying to find bad guys. I can tell you absolutely, I did not build a screen in 2010 because spoofing became illegal. I had other things to deal with. All right, that was not the first priority. And neither was not the first priority of anybody else. It is 2022, and we're talking about that behavior. So, not a good answer, but it's the answer. You know, the, the data, the message data, I don't know if it's delivered today or not. Message data is not delivered on a regular, or wasn't delivered on a regular basis. When you shake your head, you say, what are you supposed to look at? How are we supposed to know this is a crime? You know, for that, for a period of time, absolutely. So let me ask, does anybody, when they invent a derivative, come to, the, to any regulator and explain how it can be abused? No, right? You invent a product and say, go with God. It's years later you start to figure out that how things can be abused. It's not that nobody wants to do it. Everybody wants to catch it. It's very difficult. And to say, well, you should have made a, a tool. You go, okay, and everything else that we were doing, like benchmark manipulation, should stop. Maybe, maybe, I, you know, it's a, it's a question of choice. What do you want to apply your resources to? So right now, should, you look, should CFTC look at swaps at all? There are millions of open swaps of which anyone can be an incentive to manipulate. Should they look? You know, that's a question. You say, no, we shouldn't look. Okay. Which, there are weaknesses in data too. Spreads. I believe there are spread abuses all the time. Spread records are tough to come by. All right, I got the outrights. I have the, implied, uh, the matching engine implied trades and spreads, but I don't have the spread record necessarily. So how do I know which ones are being, being distorted? <laughs> you know, uh, the only thing I can say, this is what I say about trust, is that you try. You tr try as hard as you can to find the bad guy. In, uh, from a personal perspective, is spoofing a major um, uh, distortion to price. It is for the person who got spoofed because they're pushed into or pushed out of a position. Um, generally small, right? Uh, but pushed in or pushed out. They're made a decision uh, off of bad information false information. So that's a market integrity issue. So I believe spoofing from the market integrity angle, uh, right, it's a major, it's, it's a crime. But its impact to price formation is terribly tiny. And spoofing is not used as a sustainable tool to move or suppress or raise price. It's a vibratory activity. You can do a little on the upside, a little on the downside. And overall, that essentially cancels itself out from an absolute price uh, perspective. But it harms the people caught every single time. So uh, s strictly from a, uh, a opinion position, because I'm long gone, and LME is not a jurisdictional entity. It's an FBOT, yes, but it's not uh, jurisdictional, strictly speaking. Um, you're talking about that they essentially, they said stop trading. Um, cancel some trades, um, uh, and then uh, um, suspend the trading for a period of time, and, uh, and then allowed it to come back. Yeah, so the, that looks to me like when a, um, I won't say rogue market, because no market is rogue, all right? But, but to, to think of that the market doubled and then doubled again. Um, in a matter of days, uh, that there were um, obviously, so clearing in, and I, I don't want to get too far out, out of my direct experience, the clearing requirements 
um, are cured over two, two, two plus days. Um, that's a problem if the market moves very quickly. The, you can decide to close, every, close all the positions out. Um, that's, a, that's not an unreasonable position to just say you failed on your obligation to pay, therefore you're closed out. Um, that might be more disruptive to the market and um, the exchange has an obligation to try to protect itself and use the rules of protection to protect the integrity of the exchange. Whether that's right or wrong is another story, but the, they're allowed to do that. And I think that's what happened is the LME said, um, we need more time for a margin to be, um, to be collected and paid. I have a real intellectual problem with that to extend the, essentially to extend credit to someone who couldn't raise it immediately. It kind of violates just the, 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 uh, um, the sense of the integrity of the margin requirement it is you have to pay when it's against you. The cancellation of some contracts, I didn't think it was a really big deal. The, you had this doubling and doubling again, and you said, top it off, we're just gonna stop all that, just roll them all back. And it was done, um, a, I'd say a small number of trades and done pretty uh, quickly. That was less of an issue. I thought that the extension of time to allow um, the, uh, the short to find funds was a much bigger issue, much bigger. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope I was, sort of informative.